Welcome to uh, No Nonsense. You know, we really cannot know what it's like to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. But literature, sometimes more often than politics, can offer us insights and understanding. Omar Aziz was born to a working class Pakistani Canadian family in Toronto. He was educated at Queen's in Kingston, went on to study in Paris and Cambridge in London and then Yale uh, Law School and then worked as a foreign policy advisor for Justin Trudeau before becoming a writer. So all of those reasons are the reasons we've reached out to him. And then there's this one, which is, this is his book. This is his story, Brown Boy, a memoir by Omar Aziz. Now you're a little young to write a memoir, but I guess there'll be a part two at some point. Will there? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Let's uh, let's talk about this. I've read this, and and you write articles for newspapers, and so I've I've read as much uh, of what you've written as I possibly can. I think it's fair to say that we live in the age of identity politics, where we identify through what sets us apart, what makes us different, and not what we share or have in common. Um, I find that troubling. That seems to me to be your worldview. Uh, explain. Not quite. First of all, thank you okay, for that very good. kind introduction. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good kickoff point. Thank you, Senator, for that very kind introduction. I would say identity politics is one part of our politics, right? So there is a common identity we all share as Canadians, or if you're in America as an American, there are common identities that we all share, whether that's a constitution, a parliament, a history. I think what identity politics does is it wants to shine a light on some of the neglected or marginalized experiences that were not at the center for a very long time. So for example, in the United States, the history of slavery, that went on for, for that was an institution where the subjugation of black people went on for some 400 years, right? All we're saying is, or many activists, intellectuals, and writers are saying, is that we can create a literature and art that centers that identity and that experience without taking away from the the broader American or Canadian experience, right? My parents emigrated in 1970. That means right. that they've been in Canada for one third of its history as a dominion, as a constitutional democracy. So I think it's kind of, I question even the term identity politics, because when we talk about white nationalism, or we talk about, like, my argument is that white identity politics has just been called politics for a long time. Right. We don't call the discussion of the Ku Klux Klan or of various Jim Crow policies or an anti Chinese head tax as white identity politics. We just call that as politics. So I think terminologically, we have to be a little bit clear okay. here. There's a context. I, I wouldn't call a head tax on the Chinese or any of those things politics. I would call it decisions of the day. It's part of our history. We've all got histories, both personally and as countries that we may not be proud of every single moment, but it has made us who we are. And and I guess as I see that the same way personally, which is I can't go back and undo that, but I can make sure I don't ever make that same mistake again, or I don't ever treat somebody that way, or I don't ever engage in, in some behavior um, that Today is more despicable, but more importantly, it's just despicable to me. So I guess I feel the same way about countries. We did a lot of bad things, and you referenced uh, uh, the issue particularly in the U.S. With, with slavery. We've done things as a country like that, but it, it, it doesn't yet define us today. We've moved on for that. We've grown from that because those voices have spoken up and said, you can't do that anymore. And so we don't. So why? Uh, that's what I, I, I'm just seeing this as a continuum, not as something that we need to continue to focus on every minute of every day. That's a good point. Well, what I would say is it's not about you as an individual or me as an individual. It's also about right. our state. And citizenship doesn't begin yesterday or a right. month ago, as we know in your political and journalism career. Citizenship extends backwards into history and it goes into the future for future generations. So yes, we've made tremendous progress. I'm very grateful for that. I was born in Canada. I was born in Scarborough. Right. It's because of Canadian healthcare and education policies that I was able to go into some of the best schools in the land because of the yeah. opportunity that Canada gave me. With that comes a response 
responsibility. When I look at my country and I see the mass graves of indigenous children found under one Catholic church after another, that troubles me deeply, even though that was decades ago. When I look at the fact that indigenous people, many of them in our country, cannot get access to clean drinking water, that troubles me deeply. That is connected to an intergenerational history. And that's not, frankly, up to you or I as an individual to solve. That's up to all of us as a society, as Canadians, and for the state to be involved with that as well. One final point, it does not harm us and will only help us if we teach our kids accurate history. I do no, not I, that I agree it should be accurate, but but I don't know. Uh, I mean, this is this is so trite as to be, I'm not sure it's worth it, but you know, why do we rip down a statue of of John A. McDonald, who believed and acted in a way that <clears throat> people uh believed and acted that way at the time? We've all changed. Uh, progress has unfolded. The world has changed, not just our little, uh, not just our little country. I don't see what how that teaches children anything to say he was a bad guy. We're going to rip down his statue instead of saying he was the first prime minister of a country that was built on the backs not just of indigenous people but people who came from all over the world because they were seeking a better life because they were oppressed because they were fleeing poverty amongst other things your family itself is one of those stories which is you get to come to canada for a better life and their son gets to go on and become a, an intellectual yeah, I mean, it's a good story, definitely. At the same time, in the 60s, Canada had a major labor shortage, and so did the United States. So they needed we needed to liberalize and open up our, our immigration policies so we could become the competitive nation that we are around the world. So it wasn't just, it was a need on both sides. There were a yeah. tremendous amount of people that moved around, and now you look at the CEOs of all the Silicon Valley companies, they're all Indian Americans or immigrants from India. Right. There's good stories here. I don't want to take away from that. What I want to say is, with the material progress that we've made, you and I can be having this conversation to right. different parts of the world and whatnot. I want to see the same progress applied to our education, our knowledge, and to see you know young people like me who weren't taught about Indigenous history or accurate Canadian history to actually just be taught some basic fundamentals of accurate history. So I'm not opposed to John Sir John A. Macdonald, of course, the first Prime Minister of Canada, but I do want with some of those statues to at least have a play card there or some kind of insignia to also let onlookers and students and young people know this was not a saint. But, okay, that's this was not not Jesus. What we're, but that's not what we're seeing. What we see, and, and there are extremes on both ends of the political spectrum. I will absolutely give you that. Uh, but we see people thinking that that, and it's, it's in the United States, we see it other places, ripping down statues as somehow, I, I don't know how that makes anybody's life better today. I, I don't think know it makes it people's life better because I if I was an indigenous person or a black person and I saw a statue of someone who helped exterminate my ancestors or enslave them, that would make me feel some type of way walking past that every single day. I could suppress that. I could ignore it. I could channel it into other productive capabilities. But looking at that, a Confederate flag or a statue and monument, not just a statue. What is a statue? A statue is a stone structure we build up in a public square that celebrates someone. It's not a neutral, it's not a public neutral statement. It is a statement of celebration. So at a minimum, if someone has done something more ex extremely morally reprehensible in the past, let us put up on that play card, on that sign, the government of Canada, let's add a little sentence of this is how many indigenous people and children were possibly exterminated under this person's rule. That is yeah, education that's, and that, knowledge. That's again, now um, that's not history. That's that's what we're discovering and having unfold in our presence. We we know what happened in residential schools, but we can't we can't then conclude that, you know, every single grave that we find across the country is that of an indigenous child. That's what we're in the process of trying to determine uh, so that we've got a fact base here. Right. Is, isn't True. that? Well, I would say that the yes, this happened in the past, but our decision to celebrate and memorialize it continues on. And all we're doing is saying, let's have an updated conversation on history, okay? There was one 
form of history that existed in the 1800s. Then historians rewrote over that in the 1900s. We constantly have this conversation with ourselves about what our past is. It's what it means to be a democratic constitutional society. China does not do this. Russia does not do this. All they do is all they do is turn their past leaders into saints, right? Whether it's Mao Zedong well, or whether it's Nikita and, and Khrushchev. I'm, I'm not saying Johnny McDonald was a saint. I don't mean that. And we could pick many even more contemporary leaders. So what do you propose then? With well, the I'm statues, what do you propose? You want, you, well, I think it's a point in time. I think it. he built a country. He represented the beginnings of this country, which, as I say, is not perfect. And, and we don't love it every single day in every single way. But it is our home. It's where we live. So um, it's just that balance that I look for in terms of education, as you say, and giving people perspective. It wasn't just um, residential schools. It was also about building a country. So you have to kind of weigh those things off and not just say on the cards or whatever you want to put there, just the bad stuff, right? Because we're all here because somebody had a vision. True. And it wasn't just Sir John A. There were many people, right, right. early leaders, British colonialists, etc. I would say that, look, the, the 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 play cards or the signs and the existence of a monument is already itself a form of history. It's already a narrative. All I'm saying is, let us have a counter narrative and let's let the young people decide. Okay, our morals and our values and our ethics have changed. We're not living in 1867 anymore. Right. We're, we're, our, our southern neighbors aren't fighting a great war over slavery. Another thing I wasn't taught in Canadian schools, right? Many of the impetuses for the existence of, of confederation. All I'm saying is we can go a little bit deeper than at least what I got in Scarborough Public Schools. I actually think the absence of not teaching about residential schools and Indigenous history is a great moral failure for our country. And no, that it begins. I, I we absolutely have to put that as part of the history. So I felt like I was scammed. So please help. I felt like I was scammed. I felt like I was somewhat scammed, that I could go and become a 20-year-old at a top institution. I don't know actually what happened with the Indigenous people who were there before you, I, or our ancestors got there. Right. I think that's a moral failure and that we can take steps towards rectifying that. Right. I don't think it means we throw Canada out under the bus and say we live in a terrible country. Clearly not. But I think part of what makes us great is we can take steps of progress, of becoming better. And that's where I hope the direction goes. But I guess that's what concerns me because now um, you were there. What what years did you work? Uh, I mean, you were there in the early days of Justin Trudeau taking uh, office, right? Mm -hmm. Fairly early on. So he talked at that point, and, and I think this is sometimes a generational thing. He talked about Canada being a post-national state with no core identity, with no mainstream that... The flag was, to your point, a, you know, a symbol of hatred or colonization or racism or settlers. But it isn't that to everybody, right? It isn't that for people who fought a war, um, not particularly under that flag, although some of the folks in Afghanistan did. But mm -hmm. uh, people who fought a war for, for this country, I don't think they see themselves as as having no core identity or or being somehow post-national? Like, how do you, maybe you could just explain what that means to me. Yeah, I don't agree that we are a post-national state. I think we are a multicultural state. I think we've moved and evolved past our roots, but there is a core Canadian identity. We have a parliament. Our House of Commons look like looks like another House of Commons across the pond, right. right? There's an institutional history and legacy here. We are created by an act of the British parliament. You know, right. it's very important to teach this and some of those values, right? The American military intervened late in World War II. Canadian boys and boys and soldiers were there from the beginning. Yeah. Same with World War One. We can honor those. My aunt, they were there and, doing medical stuff. Yeah. They were there doing the medical yeah. stuff, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's another example of how we move towards progress on gender equality, right? At the same time, and by the way, my my uncles and great uncles fought on behalf of the crown as well as British Indian subjects. There were over 2 million soldiers and Air, Air Force people who fought in that war. So I think we can honor the legacy of the past and of our soldiers in a fighting for democracy, while at the same time recognizing that, you know, our future is multicultural. Our future is going to look like everyone in Canada. You know, it's going to be brown, black, indigenous, white, and everything in between. So but that's what makes this already. I mean, uh, I grew up in a small prairie town, uh, which was 
pretty white, but I also went to school with Indigenous kids because we lived right beside a reserve, what we now call a First Nation. So, um, you know, then I went to university and I saw more people and different colors and different religions. Like, I don't feel this just happened yesterday. Like, I feel like I also grew up and into, um, you know, a, a multiracial society. It's obviously much more dramatic now if you walk the streets of Toronto or Vancouver. Um, but, but I just feel that this is, I don't know, this is, this is part of what a new country, which we relatively speaking are, is made up of. That's, that's how you become a new country, which is people come from away. Yeah, that is true. What I will say is it didn't happen by accident and it's not going to be preserved without great dedication. Also, this is the first experiment in world history of a transcontinental multiracial democracy. Okay. There's only two that do it. There's Canada and the United States. That is it. There aren't any others. We're also only the two countries that give citizenship by birthright. We're also two of the only countries that everyone in the world wants to come to, right? So I ask myself, why is it? You know, why is it people want to come to Canada? What is it about us? And I think it is this multicultural project that, yes, has been going on since the 60s, or you can make an argument before that, but that really yeah. we've been building a strong society, a democratic society, a multicultural society. And I think like in the teaching of history, it's important, right? If you have someone who's a child from Trinidad, Trinidadian immigrants, Pakistani, indigenous, it's very important that we share a common narrative. And part of that is involved in, is, is, is telling the truth as well. Yeah, um, I agree with that totally. So I just want to come back because I was interested sure. to hear you say that you were you were not a believer in the so-called post-national state with no core identity. Um, like that's a fairly that was fairly key to what the prime minister was saying out loud, and and he did say it out loud. So what? How do you interpret that then? Where we're what what got missed in the translation there? I don't. I mean, I, this is for maybe you or someone else to ask him. I don't think he believes that Canada has is not a nation and doesn't have any identity. I mean, his name is Trudeau. His father repatriated the Constitution, yes, I know. <laughs> he gave us our identity in many yeah. ways, or part of our identity. So I don't think he believes that, or at least that phrasing of that argument. But I do think that there is a sentiment out there that the version of Canadian identity that was taught for a long time was missing key components of the story yeah, and left sure. out a lot of people. That's it. I think for sure that's good. Okay. I want to come back to you a little bit sure. more. So are you, are, are, are you a hyphenated Canadian? Is that how you see yourself? Would you describe yourself as a Pakistani Canadian? Uh, how, like, how do you use that language? I would just say I'm Canadian. That's what okay. I would say, but there's a certain terminology that we all exist with right? I'm not going to hang out with my family who have been in Canada for however long and we're arguing about hockey and then <laughs> say, we're all a bunch of Pakistani Canadians, right? That's not how we right. would talk to each other. But right. maybe to, you know, out in the world to make it easier, I might hyphenate that to just explain something. There's another part of this identity, right? But I don't put too much, um, I don't put too much emphasis on that. I mean, even when I'm in America, people ask me where I'm from. I don't. I don't find it necessary to to, to start with my parents immigrating to Canada. I say right. I'm from Canada, and the conversation goes from their house, Toronto. How are the Leafs? How are the Raptors? Right. So that's how I view my identity. And I think for a lot of people who were born here, I mean, now we've got millions and millions of Canadian kids who look like me, and right. I think that we we think of ourselves as as not post national. We think of ourselves as Canada, and in fact, the best of Canada. And I think that's what I say. That's what I say. I say, let us take the mantle of the Canadian identity and let us make it our own. And let's embody those principles of democracy and liberalism and constitutionalism and caring for our neighbors better than we have ever seen done before. So that's the challenge that I strike. I don't think it's very productive or helpful, by the way, even as we talk about history and education for us just to have an academic debate about, well, we were terrible, committed a terrible genocide in the past and let's just all mope about it now. And now we're yes. Good. Yes, um, I don't. No, I don't That's think it feel good, either. It? It's just we seem to have, we still seem to be having those clashes, uh, uh, you know, where you've got the extremes coming. You, you've you called, entitled your book, Brown Boy. Um, so you, by definition, you want to lead with that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so less than a hyphenated Canadian, you, you're saying... 
this is my this is my identity. I'm a brown boy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say that to you. I wouldn't walk into a room and say, oh, you're a brown boy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say, um, right. who are you? Mr. And Aziz and, you right. Yes, exactly. So why did you lead with that? Like, what what's that mean to you? Well, I want to say, first of all, words are contextual, right? So it depends on yeah. who says them. Right? right. So the way I would speak to you is not the way I would speak to my partner, for example. And right. there are codes of there. So with that said, that, that's very important to note. But first of all, the book was inspired by Black Boy, which is a classic text written, I think, in 1945 uh, about uh, African-American writer Richard Wright moving from the South to the North. And it deeply inspired me. And as I was beginning this memoir, it just came to me. It was like Brown Boy. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be but the opposite journey of moving from North to South and around the world, East to West. And I just thought you're right. The term in certain contexts would be a term of derision or even racism. But the term when I'm using it and reclaiming it is telling a certain story and is is owning that term with pride. I am not a white person, right? I'm not a black person. I'm not I look how I look. I grew up after 9-11. My name is Umar Aziz. I share a name with the former leader of the Taliban. I dealt with actual anti-Muslim discrimination, right? I'm not I don't need to, you know dump this on you, but I'm just saying it's a fact. And for a long time, I resisted that, especially in the hysteria of the, the wars on terror. And after, as I grew up, I was like, this is who I am and I'm going to own it. I'm going to tell the story and readers can decide for themselves. Um, that's interesting because you mentioned 9-11 and, and of course I was going down to New York in the uh, uh, time after 9-11 to be there and i think i've ref i think i've seen it in one of your articles where you were writing about um stephen harper was was worse for muslims and and creating the the, the division nation the division over muslims the 911 was and and i I'm, I'm not going to be a defender there that's not my job i'm just saying really could you <laughs> quote it for me 911 Hmm? Could you do you have the quote in front of you? No, I don't have the quote in front of me. It was one of your articles. Okay. And- I don't personally recall likening okay. Stephen Harper's uh anti naqab policies as being worse than 9-11 for Muslims, but I do think that Stephen Harper exacerbated divisions significantly. Yes. Okay, but um I don't know if I've got the uh I'm I may be conflating two things because the um the okay. current uh, his new um, advisor on Islamophobia has talked about that as well. That though, and she used the Stephen Harper reference that was worse, um, creating hate against Muslims. Um, so you don't go that far. You don't say that it was that what he said or what the province of Quebec does is worse than 9-11 or where would you where would you i mean that to me is a, i'm sorry to say i don't know who the speaker that's to me is a very ridiculous statement to make no this right? is amira al gawabi the special representative that the prime minister has appointed recently it's very controversial because of course she has written that quebec is racist she also said other things like the the flag is a uh you know a symbol of colonial settlers and and the monarchy is a huge big issue and and you know this is i guess part of the problem i'm not putting this on your shoulders i'm saying these are people who are speaking for you as you identify i think amira has been unfairly maligned and targeted a lot in a way that if she was a white guy it would not be like this it's because of not just of what she said i mean leaving aside the 9-11 comment which i hadn't heard before and i don't want to get into an absurd counterfactual or analogy, okay. but with about Quebec and some of these things, the way she's been targeted, I'm deeply worried about that. People have moved on from any kind of intellectual engagement with her points and have been targeting her personally. And I would allege that is because that she is a Muslim woman who wears the hijab. We can have a very civil argument. I've lived in Quebec. We can have a very civil argument about Quebec's different approach to identity. So and what whether, is your take on that? My take is I prefer the Anglo-American version of secularism, which is keep the state out of my church and don't tell me what to do. Okay. And I will keep my religion out of the state. Very, very simple. I'll go to my mosque. You go to your church. Our government will make secular laws. What I do not like 
is we claim secularism and then we put crosses everywhere and we target Jews and Muslims in particular, in my view. I do not like that. Let's keep it same for everyone across the board or we completely remove religion entirely. I like the fact that in Anglo-Canada and in, in America, anyone can practice their faith. Everyone's free to practice their faith. The government's not going to pick winners and losers. The government's going to be secular. It's going to keep the state away from religion. It's going to keep religion away from the state. That has worked for 200 years for a reason. But the prime minister just appointed, you know, an anti-Islamophobia special representative. So by definition, he's saying that's different than um, than anti-Semitic behavior. It's different than anti-woman behavior or like we are settling we we are highlighting these things and i'm not sure to what end well he i believe the prime minister has a gender affairs advisor a gender issues advisor i believe he already has an anti-semitic anti-semitism issues advisor to me this is more i mean i'm worried about this only being symbolic actually that's what yeah. i'm worried about. i'm worried about the other side i'm worried about this because we had a a, a mass murder of muslims in quebec We've had Muslims targeted and given slurs on the street, recorded. I used to walk the streets of Montreal. As soon as you get outside the plateau and downtown, I start getting some looks. It gets a little bit different. We're not in Toronto anymore. You know, I think if you look at the Islamophobia and the rise of Islamophobia in Canada, and especially some of the violence that we've seen, this is not only called for the special advisor. It should have been done five years ago. It should have been done after my fellow Muslims and our fellow Canadians were gunned down in their place of worship right? By a white supremacist nationalist. Let's start the conversation there. But what is the special representative? Like, how how does that change things? I mean, you know what the criticism is. This is politics. It's just, you know, kind of a, 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 a throw to the, you know, smaller communities. He's building bases, getting ready for elections, doing all that, that this will be, a, you know, a crumb for the uh, for the Muslim community. I mean, it's all covered. It's all part of politics. I get all that. But but what do you think these that kind of approach, a special representative for this, a person who sits in the window there, does that change minds? I don't know. I think it's too early to tell. And that's a good question, because we can often overdo the symbolism and then actually don't get the substance done. Right. I would hope that, look, no title in office, by the way, in Ottawa matters unless you have the authority <laughs> backed up by it, right? No, no, absolutely. Right? It doesn't even matter. You can be a chief of staff. And so I would hope that Amira has access to the prime minister, which has been difficult for even cabinet ministers to get. I hope right. that she is a liaison to different communities, not just mosques, community centers, sports centers, rec leagues, everything that have Muslim majority or Muslim, Muslim uh, predominant population, and they can relay some of those concerns and is actually doing tangible right. substantive work. Yeah, I would hope that she is serving as an active and effective liaison uh, to Muslim communities and Muslim predominant communities in Canada and meeting with the prime minister regularly and giving an update. My big worry is that we can overdo is, symbolism. If the issue is in Quebec, I mean, she met with the bloc leader the other day and you know, said she may have misspoken or misrepresented uh, her true views. And he said, too bad, so sad. That's not enough. Like, we're putting somebody in the middle of the debate that needs to be dealt with in another way. That that discussion has to be on the national political stage, not left on the desk of, you know, a new special representative uh, fighting Islamophobia. Like, that's not how we resolve stuff. Yeah, but I think what she could do is bring it to the top of the priority list, right? Like if she is an effective advocate and is given the standing and authority that she should have for this position, if it's just window dressing, if it's yeah. just a special envoy for the sake of special envoy, then frankly, what I would say, my advice wouldn't be to Ottawa. My advice would be to Muslim communities and say, we can do better. That's what I would say. I would say we can do better. We shouldn't get so excited, so happy the prime minister's come here and we've gotten a photo op and that's it, right? I, in fact, think that we should be asking for more. We should be what, what substantively is being done. We should stop sometimes totally minority, totally sometimes agree. minority communities, and I can say this, but sometimes we get very excited and happy when we just get a little bit of shine from leadership, right? That's yeah. it. We just want a photo op. And I think it's time to move past that as well. It's time to actually look at community needs, Canadian needs, and what specifically we can do to help our kids in our communities, right? And we can, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll end it. You there. you worked inside um the the Trudeau government. So that's your experience. Uh, I don't think you've worked in 
under other leaders or another. I have country. actually. Oh, have you? Okay. I was so an intern what, for Stephen Harper. Oh, okay. So what is your view of the political process and how, you know, currently this is, we've got this young prime minister, supposedly next gen kind of stuff. Um, you've written and expressed some concerns about how politics is done in this country and even in um, the current PMO. I, do you think it's a route uh, for some people or not? Like, are you now disillusioned with trying to make change, trying to educate, trying to get things done in the midst of uh, the hotbed of Ottawa? I would love to retreat to the mountains and just write books. <laughs> Wouldn't be all these days, but no, yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, opting out, especially for young people or younger people is a great failure because that would leave the political arena to everybody else. And it essentially deprives one of one's own voice. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is as polarizing and partisan as it gets to, to, to remember our core values, right? One can still lead with kindness. One can still think of one's neighbors and how to make good, effective change. What bothered me about Ottawa was it turned me into a very cynical, negative, short-termist person. It changed. It started to change me in ways where I th okay. and for very negative ways. Okay, I really want you to delve down in that because I've I have you know I'm obviously much older, but um, I remember coming to this town the first time. You know, a young prairie girl and walking in front of the Parliament buildings and saying to myself, "Oh my God, one day." One day mm. I'm going to be there. Now, I've been in and out of this place for 40 years now, doing a variety of different things, journalism and all of that. And and I find that I'm probably more disheartened now than I was at the earlier stages. You're sounding disheartened much earlier. I was disheartened pretty soon. <laughs> I was just hardened pretty soon. I'm I'm a policy wonk. I'm a politics guy. I grew up in the working class. I want to connect with people. I want us to be honest. I was disheartened by some of the short termism, the playing to, to to tomorrow's headlines, a lot of the infighting between political staffers. I found super petty. I found just a lot of inexperience. I found like what's the big picture here? There was a lack of that. And I tried. I tried my best. I tried my best to, to make effective change from within, but you come up against roadblocks, right? And I just think that if we had if we had some better people and some more thought, we we would have even bigger policy victories. And that to me is gonna I hope that isn't the verdict ultimately of the Trudeau years that this was great, but it could have been so much better. Um, you you weren't coming against roadblocks just because of color. You're not saying that. You're saying there's a roadblock in terms of ideas or thinking longer term or wider like yeah i mean i would say i would say it's both i don't look like your average staffer at that time either i hadn't been in the liberal party for 30 40 years so people are naturally suspicious i went to law school in america i had a pretty good relationship with like senior leadership it was often like a lot of the staffers who were my age or a little bit older who had been there a lot of turf protection and i get it some of this is just classic normal ottawa but you know we were going out in public saying things like we were really supporting vocally minorities and women, and feminism, post-racism. And at, within on the inside, I thought that we weren't living up to our standards and principles. And for me, my bedrock line is at a minimum, we should not be overtly hypocritical. We can't be out there every single day talking about race and feminism if I, within our own house if we haven't gotten it in order and there's allegations of racism and discrimination. Number two, a good government is run by good management, okay? You have to manage well. You cannot just have a chief of staff and a principal secretary and all the files are being clogged in their office and we get nothing done. And then when we get something done, we make fools of ourselves. That is not acceptable, okay? I saw the president's uh, State of the Union address last night. I know some of his advisors. I know however you agree or disagree with Biden, they're running a very good operation. They have smart people there. And so that makes our disagreements even more fun and substantive. If everyone, no one knows what they're really doing and we're sending the prime minister to India and he's, you know, not dressed appropriately or, you know, these photos have come out or whatever. I think that is a failure, not just of policy, but of personnel.
Okay, I've got to ask you about that because the, both of these things um, tread very closely to what you talk about, what you write about. So the Prime Minister of Canada has blackface on. There are photos of him in blackface. And and he says, well, I was young and I made a mistake. I mean, he grew up probably more privileged than any other single individual I can think about in this country. He had from literally the time of his birth exposure to the world and mm. to world leaders who came and went from his home. They would have been of all colors and all ages. I, so how does that still happen if he's a modern guy? I think being a privileged white male allows you to get away with things in our society that a woman or a minority would not be allowed to get away with and that could destroy their career. And again, some of these terms, white supremacy, white privilege, you know, you hear it and you're like, well, everyone's saying it, but that is the literal definition. That is the privilege. The privilege is, is that you can even humiliate others. You can make a fool of yourself. You can condescend towards others. You can cross the line towards others and still there will be no repercussions. But, so, but why? I mean, he's in a why? very particular place. I'm saying we can all name another dozen political leaders uh, or you know, people in the game who, had they done that, their careers would be over, and they too would be white males. Um, but their careers would have been over. So why the exception um, for him? And and again, I guess it comes to the 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 dress, the bizarre dress in India, which must have been an insult to all of his hosts um, when he got there. I'm not sure if it was an insult. It was just kind of funny because the Indians were wearing suits. And uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, so that was some of the jokes that we were telling. I would say with Trudeau, I mean, he's been an exceptional individual, an exception for his entire life, right? He has a Trudeau name. He was like, basically, he's lived a very charmed life. And I think people have given him the benefit of the doubt as they did in 2015, as they did subsequently. Yeah. Some of that faith was in the work that he was doing. So people could be like, yeah, he did this thing through uh, 20 years ago when he was 29, but look at all he's done for our community in Canada now. So I think there was a way to, and he also never really addressed it. Like he could just kind of address it and moved on and talked about climate change. So it was just like everyone forget. And that speaks to some of the weakness of our society. I mean, Everyone in Ottawa, if everyone's white and the press pool is white, and the, how who's going to ask him a question about this being racist? Did you see the photo of the bus, that, of the journalist that followed the prime minister after blackface came out? It was just all white people. Okay, and again, that's fine, but it's it might get a little bit awkward to ask him about racism and blackface if you just had one person there. This was my argument for diversity, by the way. If you had one diverse minority person around the table, at least something like the India trip wouldn't have happened because that person could put up their hand and be like, hey, this is going to be offensive. I know all of you guys agree, but let me give you my contrarian opinion. The prime minister, any leader needs to hear that. And unfortunately, in this government, I think when you have a more contrarian position or you want to try and help the leadership by being honest, that can backfire for you. And your career so why don't you just keep your mouth shut and agree well, that's with everyone. what i was going to say i mean if you're new and you're young and it doesn't actually matter what color you are particularly but if if you're low man on the to totem pole you're not going to sit in that meeting while they're planning the trip to india and say hold on you're going to look like a fool and this is going to be embarrassing so please don't do that because they're going to look at you and say uh go get coffee right like <laughs> you're too young to have a you're too young to have a vote on this I mean, I had, uh, I wasn't in that m meeting room, but I was in many meeting rooms, um, including in the foreign ministry and with the then foreign minister, current deputy prime minister. And I knew Mr. Butts and I knew the senior leadership. And, when, and in my case, I had been at the UN and been trained by White House officials at Yale. So I would say I would have put my hand up. I wasn't in office at that time, but I would have right. said something for sure. And if that got me into trouble, that get, gets you into trouble and you see how it played out the other way. So I think like being a good staffer is not being a good yes man or woman either. Uh, it's about uh, being able to tell the principal things that they might not want to hear. And yeah, that's built upon trust. But there was really a culture of distrust and mistrust around Trudeau. Like I think he's been taken advantage of or people have wanted things from him his entire life that they're just kind of paranoid about, you know, newcomers and what are people's actual agendas. And that's not really helpful. You get into a kind of palace intrigue then and people infighting and not getting anything done. And to me, honestly, Senator, forgive my French, but I thought this is bullshit. 
I yeah. thought this is not why I work so hard. I can't even serve the people that I think of every single day, do nothing for our communities. I don't care about this business card anymore. And I resigned. And when I resigned, they asked me like, where's your job? Where are you going? Are you going to go work for the concern? No, I just, I can't be part of this. I can't justify this to myself anymore. And, you know, I, I sent a lot of memos to them and I sent a lot of briefings to them. And I, I don't know if things got better, but we kind of are where we are seven, eight years in. And there's a real question of what the legacy is going to be. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. So what are you going to be when you grow up? Or are you <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I'm uh <laughs> I believe in the art of politics. You're not supposed to uh show all your cards. Yes, and poker. Okay. I'm not sure yet. I want to put this book out. I'm working on another book on the rise of the far right and fascism. That's something that deeply worries me. Uh, yeah. any sort of going around the constitutional structure. Um, I want to be involved, continue to be involved in politics, progressive policy, and really try and mobilize and work with communities as well, not just be, you know, in Washington or Ottawa. So my whole philosophy is I want to bridge the gap, like between the, these high-end ideas and politics and elites and stuff, and like on the ground in the street and making sure that translates. Because um, often it hasn't, right, for a long time. And you know, our wages have stagnated, working communities struggle, um, you know, this climate issue. So uh, there are a lot of a lot of things that are going to impact me and my generation in particular that I really want to work on. The exact avenue of working on those issues, I haven't made a decision yet. So um, a Barack Obama, you know, a community organizer, Black president of the United States, um, are you still seeing yourself maybe coming back in at a different time to go into uh, a more powerful leadership role as opposed to uh, a worker bee, an advisor, a guy on the streets, the writers of books? Maybe that's the, the route, but do you keep all those options open for yourself? I will not be a staffer again. <laughs> So you're either going to have the top job or not at all. And you said it, but what I'll say, what I'll say <laughs> is I want to, you know, the people I trust with power the least are the ones who have wanted it the most yeah. and have planned for it the most. Very I think ordinary role. voters, I think ordinary vo voters can tell that as well. What I will say is I don't want to make any exact predictions, but <clears throat> I care deeply about these issues. I'm, I've been working on these issues. And if there's an opportunity and the right path to make actual effective change, through elected office in Canada, I will take it. I'm not hewing it to, well, I need this job or this position or yeah. be prestigious, yeah. right? I've already done enough and there's other things that I would want to do. But yeah, I'm keeping my future, I'm keeping the future open and life is strange, right? And surprising and you go through many phases. So I'm looking forward to all that's next. Yes, I couldn't have imagined that even in my own life, but I'm a big believer in serendipity, right? That opportunity yes. comes along, but you have to be willing and prepared to say yes to stuff absolutely. that you hadn't thought about or might prove scary. Absolutely. I agree. Are you ready dad, for those surprises? Yeah. Are your mom and dad proud of you? How how do they I mean you had this big job in Ottawa and then you quit and say I'm gonna write books. So are they going, oh my God, what's the matter with him? Didn't we raise him better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a challenge, but at the end of the day they loved me and they saw the change it had brought in me. Okay. You know how I got jaded and suspicious of people and how I was mistrusting my friends and just what it was doing to me. I think they were happy that I always believed in myself. I knew it would work out. I knew everything would be fine. I had come to peace with it. And I'd also done everything imaginable, Senator, to try and not to avoid that outcome, basically, where right. I'm like, all right, I'm at it. Because no one no one just resigns from staffer jobs, never mind at a right. federal ministry. So they are proud. And uh, and I owe them a phone call. <laughs> okay, you do that. As soon as we <laughs> hang up, you phone yes. them. All right. Omar Aziz, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. And I know sometimes we have to go through those basics and those old truisms, but, but we need to keep having that conversation because not everybody is where your head is, right? So, and certainly not everybody's where mine is. So, like, as long as we're talking, I think we're keeping things, uh, I think we keep things moving forward.
Yeah, thank you so much, Senator. And I do want to say, you know, I was really reared and trained on the notion that you engage with people you disagree with or you might disagree with. That's how you learn. Right. And so that that's something that worries me. And I hope that in Canada and elsewhere, we continue having dialogue and conversations, especially across potential political divides. I think it's incredibly deeply important. It's part of democracy. As I said to the at the very beginning, it's all about, you know, we can't really walk a mile in each other's shoes, but but we can find ways to understand that experience. And I think this book is one of them. It's called Brown Boy, Omar Aziz, and it will be out in April. We didn't talk a lot about the specifics in the book. There's lots of good stories there, but that's because of the way the publishing world works. And uh, and you don't want to give away all the secrets. Maybe we can have another conversation after it's out. We will do. You take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Good to talk to you. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense. We'll see you again soon.